We now take you into a service already in progress where Pastor Ashish exhorts the congregation and leads them in making the declaration. And right after this is a life-changing message for you. Say this out loud and bold with me. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. We're doing a series called Seven Spices, and we're going to talk about the fourth spice this morning. We're using 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11 as our foundation text for this entire series. So let's just read that once again. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Peter writes, he says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if we do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've been reading this text uh, every Sunday last couple of weeks. And uh, just to quickly review what Peter has stated for us, he's telling us that we need to add to our faith seven ingredients or seven spices as we're calling them. You need to add to your faith each one of these seven things. And he says you must have them in ever abounding, ever increasing measure. He tells us if you do these, if you do have these seven things, you, it'll ensure that you are fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you're bearing fruit in your Christian life. And also you will be stable or you will be unshakable in your walk with God. On the other hand, he says, if you do not have, do not add these things to your faith, he says, then you tend to be short-sighted, even to blindness, meaning that you're unable to look at eternal things. You're blinded to spiritual realities and tend to only look at the here and the now or the temporal. Instead of being able to look at things from a spiritual, eternal perspective. And he said the other danger is if you do not add these things, then he says you forget that you were cleansed from your old sins. You have a tendency to go back to your old way of life. So these seven ingredients are so important for us to add to our faith. You have faith in Jesus, that He's your Lord and your Savior. You need to move on from there to add these things to your faith. And what we're doing is examining each one of them one by one. We talked about virtue or good character. We've talked about knowledge or spiritual understanding. Last Sunday, we talked about discipline. After last Sunday's service, one young man came and said, Pastor, you've given us so many things to work on. <laughs> like, got to discipline all these areas of my life. Anyway, so we talked about discipline or self-control or temperance last Sunday. This morning, we want to talk about the fourth ingredient, which is in the, in the New King James, it's called perseverance. And, um, and some of the other versions will use the word patience or endurance. We're going to talk about endurance. We'll just use the word endurance. Add to your faith 
endurance. In the Greek for that word simply means to be cheerful or hopeful endurance. It's a cheerful kind of endurance. Not something that says, oh no, I've got to put up with this kind of attitude. But it's a cheerful endurance that Peter is talking about. A hopeful endurance. It also refers to constancy, patient continuance of waiting. I like to describe endurance by looking at these four different aspects or dimensions of endurance. What is endurance? It's the ability to press through with determination. So it's the ability to press through with determination, perseverance, overcoming all kinds of obstacles. Endurance is also the ability to pursue with a resolve. That cannot be diminished with time or difficulties. So God's given you a dream. You started a project. You're working on an assignment. And you pursue with a resolve. That does not weaken. That does not diminish with time or difficulty. Endurance is also the ability to patiently wait till the expected outcome arrives. You're praying for something, believing God to provide in your life. And you've got to patiently wait till that the expected outcome arrives in your life. So that requires endurance. That is endurance. And lastly, endurance is also the ability to passionately hold on to what is right and true with a firmness that cannot be weakened. Especially in the face of persecution, suffering, or even temptation. You're holding on to what is right. You're holding on to what is true. With a firmness that cannot be weakened. That's endurance. You're demonstrating endurance. And endurance is what gives us durability or longevity. Endurance is the difference between us being a shooting star and a shining star. That big difference is endurance. And uh, endurance can be developed. In the natural, we know how to develop endurance. And, and again, going back to athlete as an example. Now, in case, if you want to do a five-kilometer run, you're not going to wake up one morning, roll out of bed and say, today I'm going to run five kilometers. You probably will not have the endurance and the stamina required to do that. But there is nothing keeping you from developing the endurance required to do that. You begin, maybe you first make sure you run the, run the 100 meters. Then you stretch it up to 200. And you slowly push the limit day after day. Just push the limit, work your way up until at some point, maybe after several weeks, maybe some months, you, are, you, you have the required stamina, the required endurance to complete the entire five kilometers. So you have developed endurance with training by pushing yourself beyond your comfortable limits over a period of time. So then we need to think about spiritual endurance. You know, what helps us develop spiritual endurance? First of all, we could say that endurance is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 20 to 23, we see that long suffering or patience is a work of the Spirit. Temperance, as some versions would use it, is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something the Holy Spirit helps develop in you and me. But the Bible also makes it very clear that in James chapter 1 and verse 2, or verse 3, the testing of your faith develops endurance. The testing of your faith develops endurance. So if we are to develop endurance in our lives, our faith has to be tested. The testing of your faith develops endurance. The Bible also says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, it says tribulation produces endurance or tough situations. That's what tribulation means. It's an old word that simply means tough situations, difficult situations. Difficult situations produce endurance. So, 
as believers, the Bible tells us, add to your faith endurance. How are you going to develop this endurance? The testing of your faith produces endurance. You got to be willing to allow your faith to be tested. Tough situations, tribulations produces endurance. See, sometimes we say, God, you know, just make it easy for me. Faith, make faith like a switch. As soon as I press the button, out comes the answer. But then if faith was like as simple as that, as, as easy as that, then how are you going to develop this essential ingredient called endurance? And some of you say, God, you know, I'm so blessed, God, I just don't want any trouble. Everything I think, everything I plan, everything I say must happen exactly the way I want it. No problems, no difficulties in life. But if that's the way life is going to be, how are you going to develop endurance? Because tribulation, tough situations, develops endurance. So as a believer, you and I must be ready to have our faith tested, ready for some tough situations in life. Because that's the way endurance or perseverance or, or patience is developed in us. So let's talk about some life situations that require endurance. What kind of life situations require endurance from us? Here are some things. When Number one, when things require time, effort, and preparation, you need endurance. There are a lot of things in life that require time, effort, and preparation. They don't come easy. They don't come outside of time, effort, and preparation. Now, you want to be a doctor. That's a very noble ambition, but it requires time. Four to five years in medical school plus a few more years in graduate school. Effort, a lot of preparation. You want to get your bachelor's degree? Nobody's going to give you a bachelor's degree because you sat in class for six months. It takes a little more than that. Three years. Four years, in some cases, five years. It requires time, effort, and preparation. So what do you need for that? You need endurance. To go through the time, effort, and preparation. Even fun things in life sometimes require time, require endurance, like fishing. Now we, were at the, we were at the resort there in, in the foothills and in Mudumalai, and there was a pond over there, and Joshua and Ruth wanted to go fishing, so I got them fishing rods, they're sitting there, I said, all of us, you know, you sit down, <laughs> you know, how you do, when you want fishing, when you want to go fishing, you put the, the bait in, and you just wait. It requires a lot of endurance. <laughs> a lot of endurance. You just sit, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait till the fish bites the bait. So Amy was the most successful one, she caught two fishes. <laughs> so even fun things in life, require endurance. And the same about Christian ministry. Even Christian ministry requires a lot of endurance. So those of you who are saying, you know, I want to serve God. One thing you can take for granted, you will need to develop a lot of endurance. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I think it's verse 3, he said, or was it 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3, he says, you Thou therefore, that's a King James Version, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He says, Timothy, you're in the ministry, you're pastoring a church. Here's one thing I want you to do. You must endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And Paul talks about himself in verse 10. He says, I therefore endure all things for the elect's sake. He says, you know, I endure, I go through all kinds of stuff. Just for the sake of God's people. So Christian ministry is not, you know, just an easy thing that you just, you know, get up and preach and everybody listens to you. And, you know, it's tough. It's, you need to have endurance if you're going to be a minister of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when do you need your endurance? When things require time, effort, preparation? You also need endurance when things go wrong. Not everything in life is going to go just the way you planned it. And say, okay, I'm going to do this on day one, this on day two, and this on day three. And that's, I'm set for life. But not everything in life is just going to go the way you plan it to go. 
things will tend to go wrong. Unexpected things will happen. And when things go wrong, no matter how small or how big, you need endurance to press past that. To press past that hurdle. To press past that obstacle. And to keep moving towards your end goal. You know, unfortunately, many times when things go wrong, we Christians have a very spiritual statement. We say, maybe God does not want me to do that. Just put the blame on God. And just, you know, just say, okay, I'm, I'm giving up on it. But really, just because you find an obstacle in your path, just because there's a hurdle, just because things go wrong, they don't go the way you want them to go, doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to do it. God has just allowed it in your life so that you can develop some endurance and press past that. Amen? Now, I remember, you know, this was a couple of weeks ago. We had this pastor's, we had arranged for this pastor's meeting. Uh, it was a Tuesday morning. We said, you know, all of us are going to gather together in Campus Crusade. The meeting, 8.30 to 9 is breakfast. Meeting starts at 9. And uh, I was all set, you know. I, I really wanted to be there before time because one of the things we want to set as an example for our pastors is our pastor's meetings must start on time. Which normally doesn't happen, right? So, 8 o'clock, I was ready. I left home, went down to the basement, went to the car, and I had a flat tire. It's like, oh God, of all days, Tuesday, this day, I have a pastor's meeting, and I'm all so keen on making sure the meeting starts sharp at 9, and I have a flat tire. And, you know, all the presentations, everything's on my laptop. I have to be there, only then things can start. And so, I called them up. I say, you know, this happened. I have to change my tire. And I change the tire. I'm all sweating. Go back up, change, and go get there. But eventually I get there at 9, 10. And there are 50 or more pastors looking at me. <laughs> I'm the one who's late. And I apologize. I spoke to them and, you know, and everything went started. But, you know, I did not, that morning when I saw the flat tire, I did not say, oh, no, maybe God does not want us to do this. Maybe this is a sign from heaven. This is Balaam's donkey. Speaking to me saying, don't go. I didn't say that. It was just an obstacle. In this case, it's a small thing. Just an obstacle that I had to press past to make sure that I pursue what I've set out to pursue. It's just a small example. But in life, that things tend to go wrong. They don't always work out the way you intended it. But that does not mean you give up. And don't blame God for it. You must press past The hurdle, press past the obstacle and pursue. So you need endurance to press through with determination. You need to pursue with a resolve that cannot be diminished with time or difficulty. A third life situation would be when things are delayed. You're expecting things to happen in a certain time frame, maybe in six months, maybe in a year, in two years, whatever. But for some reason, it's delayed. It doesn't happen in six months. It doesn't happen in a year's time. It doesn't happen in two years' time. And you need endurance to continue believing God, believing that He will come through for you. You need the the ability to patiently wait for your desired outcome. Another life situation where you and I will need endurance is when things distract or discourage. Sometimes you set out on the right path. You're going, you're following God. You're pursuing and you're doing things that God wants you to do. And there is distraction or there is opposition. There is persecution. And it is in those moments that you need the ability to passionately hold on to what is right and true. With a firmness that cannot be weakened. And that requires endurance. Just to hold on to what is right. When you're facing temptation. Temptation is basically a distraction from what is right and true. Trying to get you to deviate from what is right and true. And what must you do? To, you must passionately hold on to what is right and true, even in the face of temptation. The Bible says in James chapter 1, I think it's verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Sometimes, in some temptations, you say, get thee behind me and it goes. But some temptations, you have to endure. Meaning, You've got to go through time holding on, passionately holding on to what is right and true with a firmness that cannot be shaken. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. The same thing with suffering. Many times you are wrongfully 
you suffer wrongfully, for not, not for any particular reason of your own. And you need endurance to go through it, to stand for what's right, to keep doing what's right, even when you are wronged incorrectly. Peter writes about that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 21. 1 Peter 2, 18 to 21. I just like to read that. He says, servants, or if you just modernize it, means employees. Be submissive to your masters with all fear. Not only to the gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, that is, if you endure it, this is commendable before God. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. So, Enduring patiently when you are wrongfully judged, Peter says that's commendable before God. And you and I also need endurance when we are persecuted for our faith. In Mark 13 and verse 13, Jesus says, you will be hated by all men for my name's sake. But if you endure to the end, you will be saved. You got to endure to the end. You need endurance when you are suffering wrongfully. To hold on, passionately hold on to what's right and true. What I'd like to do in the rest of the time we have here is to talk about what to do when you are enduring. I mean, what do you do when you're going through the test of your faith? What do you do during the season, the time where you are enduring? It could be a couple of months. Sometimes it could be a prolonged period of time, maybe years of enduring what do you do? How do you keep yourself together during your time of enduring the test of your faith or enduring a very tough situation in life? How do you keep yourself together? What, what do you do when you are enduring? Here are some things that I just want to share with you, just, just things that help me. First of all, the Bible tells us to look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, very well-known passage to us, the writer of Hebrews says, you know, brethren, seeing that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the Christian life is more like a marathon rather than a sprint. You've got to run with endurance, the race that is set before us. And verse 2, he says, while you're doing this, looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Look at him. Let him be your model. Let him be your example. Let him be your inspiration. Looking at Jesus. And what part of Jesus he point us to? He says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And today is seated at the right hand of God. So he says, I want you to run your race, looking at Jesus, and understanding that even Jesus endured stuff. He went through some really difficult times, through shame and pain and disgrace and humiliation. He went through this. Why? Because of the joy that was set before him. So he says, you run your race like this. Look ahead to the joy that's coming up, and you can endure anything that you have to go through. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The second thing, or this is in no particular order of importance, but another thing that I like to do when I'm enduring things is to anchor myself on the promise of God. Anchor yourself on God's promise. What I've observed is that in any season of life that you're going through, any season of difficulty that you're passing through, God usually gives you one or two promises from His words just to anchor yourself on. And I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing. That there's one verse or a couple of verses from Scripture that really speak to you in that season. Something that you can anchor yourself on during that difficult period. So learn to anchor yourself on that promise. Keep meditating Rest your soul, your mind on that word. This is what God has spoken to me in this season of life. Anchor yourself on that promise. Amen? 
I don't know if you all are asleep or awake. <laughs> Amen. I don't know why it's hard this morning, but we'll go through it. It requires endurance. <laughs> Anchor yourself on a promise of God. And wait patiently for God to fulfill that promise. Maybe I'll put some more energy into my speakers. <laughs> the psalmist said in Psalm 40, verses 1, 2, and 3, he said, you know, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined his ear to my cry, and he, and he heard me. And he brought me out of a horrible pit, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise to my God. And many will hear it and be glad and fear God. So he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. To anchor yourself on the promise of God and wait patiently for him. Because he can bring your feet out of the horrible pit. No matter what your situation is, how desperate, how tough, how difficult, how horrible a pit you might find yourself in. When you anchor yourself on the promise of God and wait patiently for him, he can bring you up and set your feet upon the rock. Put a new song in your mouth. Establish your ways. Amen. Another thing to do when you're going through stuff, when you're enduring things, is to be inspired by testimonies. And this is what James tells us in James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. I'd like us to read that. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. James is talking a lot about patience here. And here's what James says. In James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11, he says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Seeing how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience or endurance. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance or endurance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So as James is encouraging the people to be patient, he points them to the life testimonies of Old Testament prophets. He says, brethren, look at all the Old Testament prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Look at them as an example. Be inspired by them. And he specifically points to Job as an example of endurance. He says, be inspired by his life. Because you know the end of the Lord. That in the end, everything is going to work out for good. That the Lord is gracious. And he is good. He is compassionate. He comes through with his goodness. Amen. So he says, therefore, take inspiration from the examples of these men. Be inspired by Abraham who believed God 25 years to see God fulfill that promise of, having, of him having a son. Be inspired by Joseph, who went through tough situations before God lifted him up. Be inspired by David, who, you know, who had to run for his life, lived in the wilderness before he could become king. Be inspired by the lives of these men and women of God in the Bible. Be inspired by what God is doing among other believers. You look at somebody else's life and say, wow, God came through for him. God came through for her. God changed the situations in their life. And, and that's why we like to share testimonies because it can bring encouragement to our hearts. Amen? And Revelation 19 verse 11 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Every time a testimony is given, a prophetic word is released, meaning that testimony is now bound to repeat itself in the lives of people. It's like a prophetic word, a prophetic utterance being released. Every testimony of Jesus is a prophetic utterance. So even in nature, you find that God works differently. There is no set time for each and every step that God wants to accomplish in your life. So while you're encouraged through testimonies of God working in different people's lives, Keep in mind that the processes of God are different for each one of us. He doesn't carbon copy or doesn't Xerox copy the processes. But at the end result is the same. We all are going to experience the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. 
Another thing I do while going through things in life, while enduring things, is to welcome the present objectives. As God is taking you to an end goal, He is also accomplishing intermediary things in your life. And in each stage, you and I must welcome what God is teaching, what God is doing. Welcome the present objective. What is God teaching you now? Yes, God is taking you to something big and great in the days to come. But the foundation for that is built on something He's doing in your life right now. What lesson does God want you to learn? What spiritual truth does God want you to assimilate in this stage, in this moment of your life? What change is He bringing about in your heart at this moment? That is very important. Probably as important as the end goal that you're working towards. So in each stage of life, in each moment of life, assimilate, welcome the present objective that God is accomplishing in you. Because it's part of God taking you to your final destination. Are you with me so far? All those are asleep, say amen. No, I don't know why it's really tough this morning. But. All right? So welcome the present objective. What is God doing for you? That's what James says. Count the joy, brethren, when you're going through trials. I mean, hey, you're going through trials, but count it joy. Enjoy the journey. You are going to get to your final destination. The present situations might be tough, but count the joy anyway. Receive the present objectives that God is accomplishing in your life. You know, there's something that we can learn about God from, or several things we can learn about God from the first chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. You read Genesis chapter 1 and you find, you know, an account of the first six days of uh, creation. It keeps saying, you know, and God said, and God said. On day two, God said. On day three, God said. On day four, God said. Have you ever imagined what would have happened if God just made one sentence and said the whole thing in one sentence? I mean, maybe everything could have just taken place in one sentence, in one moment. I mean, why did God need six days? He didn't need six days. He could have just said one sentence, you know. Let there be light. The sun, the moon. Let the heavens separate creating a sky, and let the waters gather up into the oceans and let there be dry land and let the sea, let the oceans have all kinds of creeping creatures in it and let the land uh, give birth or spring up with all kinds of vegetation and let there be animals and finally let there be man and woman in our own image. Full stop. One sentence. And everything could have been created probably in one sentence, in one moment. He had the power to do it. He did it after all. Why did he do it in six days? Why did he break it up in six days? A couple of things that you you and I can learn about God. And it is this. One is God works in a progressive manner. God works in a progressive manner. He chose to do it in six days. Progressively. Each day he had said things to do. He did them. The next day some more things. Next day, some more things. God works in a progressive manner. It's the same with you and me. He works in our lives progressively. Building upon what He has done yesterday. Building tomorrow on what He is doing today. He works in our lives. So what God is doing today is very important. Because He's going to build on that tomorrow. God works In a progressive manner. I like how one preacher put it. He said, you know, to count from 1 to 100, all you need to know is to count from 1 to 10. Because everything else is just 1 to 10 at a new level. So you go 1 through 10. And you go from 11 to 20. You go from 21 to 30. It's same, 1 to 10, but just at a new level. And that's how God works in our lives. As He's taking us from where we are to the stage of 100 We go through different levels, but the same stages repeat. You're going in stage 1, level 1, stage 1, level 2, stage 1, level 3, stage 4, stage 1, level 4. You're going through the same stages, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but at new levels as God is taking you. 
to your level 100. And every stage is important because God is putting something in you. So welcome today, whatever God is achieving in your life as he takes you to your destination. The other thing that you can observe in Genesis chapter 1 is that at the end of each day, the Bible says God saw that it was good. So he did what he had to do on day 3, and the Bible says, and he saw that it was good. Day 4, he did what he had to do. At the end of the day, he saw that it was good. Day 5, he did what he had to do. At the end of the day, he saw that it was good. I think that's a lesson for all of us. See, many of us, at the end of the day, when we go to bed, at the end of each day, celebrate what God's done. Today in your life, celebrate what God is doing. I like what Joyce Meyer says. She says, I know I'm not where I should be, but I also know I am not where I used to be. So celebrate where you are today. Amen? God saw that it was good. Celebrate what God's doing in your life. Welcome the present objectives in your life. A couple of other things here that I try to do as I'm enduring things, just as you're enduring this present sermon, is, <laughs> you know, I was just thinking, if, you know, in some churches, a sermon is 15 minutes long, right? In some churches, maybe it's 30 minutes long. But here at APC, you've all developed endurance. <laughs> You can endure a 45-minute sermon. Sometimes it goes to an hour. Okay. Stick to the original vision and make adjustments if necessary. That's one thing I've learned as, we, as you go through the testing of your faith, as you go through difficult situations, is to stick to the original vision. Don't give up on the original vision just because your faith is being tested or just because you're going through some difficulties or challenges. Stick to the original vision. Now, God may want you to make some adjustments. That's fine. Make those adjustments. But it's very rare that God says, I started with the wrong blueprint for your life. It's very rare. Stick to the original vision. What did God make you for? What did God design you for? What was a dream God breathed into you when you began this journey? Stick with that vision. Don't give up on it just because your faith is being tested. Or just because you're going through some tribulations. And lastly, remember the end result. Picture the final destination. Let it inspire you. The joy that is set before you. Keep that before you. Now you and I must understand that the processes of God take time. But the promotion of God comes in a moment. The processes of God take time. But the promotion of God comes in a moment. Joseph, 13 years, he went through all kinds of things, sold as a slave, falsely accused, put into prison. It was a tough process, but it was probably two or three hours in which he went from being a prisoner to becoming a prime minister. The people of Israel, God wanted to make them into a big mighty nation. For 400 years, he kept them in Egypt, and they were slaves. That was the process of God. Taking one family, Joseph, making them into a big nation. It took 400 years, the process of God. But in one moment, in fact, in half a night, an entire nation of slaves became free men. And not only did they become free men, but in half a night, the wealth of Egypt was transferred into their hands. The process of God took 400 years. The promotion of God took half a night. And like that you could just go on. Think about David. In the wilderness for. I think 17 years. Running. As a, as, as a fugitive. Hiding in caves from Saul. But he had the promise of God. Which said you'll become king. The process of God took 17 years. But it took half a day. After Saul died. The very next day. People came and made him king over Judah. The processes of God will take time. But when the set time for your life has come, when the time of God's favor for your life has come, the promotion of God comes in a moment. So as in a race, 
in Christian life, we are rewarded not for how we started the race, but for how we finished it. The medal is not given to the one who ran off the blocks first, but for the one who reached the line first. It's not how well you start, it's how well you finish that matters. Why do things take time? Why are things delayed? And you could just think of different reasons. One thing you and I understand about God is that God works in the kairos moment, in the fullness of time. In the Greek, there are two words, kairos and chronos for time. And the Bible says God always works in the kairos moment, in the fullness of time, when the time is ripe. What is the ripe time? It's a time when God has positioned people. you got people, you got places and things, everything in order. That's the kairos moment. When he's got you ready for it, that's the Kairos moment. So God is always waiting for the Kairos moment to release things into your life. God always works in the fullness of time. He promised the son in the Garden of Eden, but he only sent him thousands of years later in the fullness of time. God's promise comes to you in the beginning of your journey, but you receive its fulfillment at the Kairos moment in your life, in the fullness of time. Some of the things that God would want to accomplish in our lives during that, uh, to arrive at the Kairos moment is to bring us to a place where we can value what He's giving to us. Now, have you ever gone to a restaurant and you ordered your, this happened to us when we went to meet Pastor Steve. Pastor Grenville said, come, I'll take you to this best, this good restaurant. You get good sizzlers there. I said, okay, let's all go, you know. So we all went, I forgot the name of the restaurant, but we all went, sat down. He said, you know, here's the best sizzlers in Uti. So Pastor Steve, his full family, and our family, Pastor Moses and his wife, we all sat down there. We ordered the sizzlers, and we were waiting. <laughs> it seemed like an eternity, just shy of an eternity. <laughs> but at the end, you know, when they brought the food, it was worth it. We enjoyed it. So sometimes the value for what you're waiting goes up as you wait longer for it. You value it more. You you treasure it more. It's worth the wait. Another thing that happens as you're waiting for, you know, for what God is doing in your life is that your level of desperation increases. And there are some things in the Christian life that you need a certain level of desperation not only to receive it, but to also keep it. And until God sees that level of desperation rise up to that level, He's going to wait. Because it takes a certain amount of desperation to maintain that in our lives. Amen. So there are several reasons why God allows us to go through a season of enduring before we see the outcome. Lazarus was sick. Mary and Martha sent Jesus an SMS. He whom you love is sick. Please come quickly. They were using Airtel there. And I'm just, I'm just joking. But Jesus didn't respond to the SMS. He just stayed for two days. And by the time he arrived in Bethany, it was four days late. And Martha says, you know, uh, if he had only come early, my, my, my brother would not have died. It's four days now he's in the grave. Why? Jesus said, I'm doing this so that you may believe. And he challenges Martha and Mary. He says, did I tell you that if you will believe, you will see the glory of God. Brings them to a place where only believing God can see the outcome. Nothing of human effort can bring it about. Bringing us to a certain level of faith. God waits. The good thing about enduring, going through, going through tough situations in life, is that endurance builds character. Romans 5 verse 3. Endurance builds character. This is the way you're going to build character in your life. Endurance brings maturity, James 1 and 3. It says, let endurance have its complete work so that you may be perfect, that you may be mature. Endurance brings maturity. If you want to be a mature Christian, you've got to first have endured stuff because endurance produces maturity. You want to have strong character, you need to go through stuff because endurance develops character. Endurance also brings God's approval on your life. The Bible says, blessed is a man who endures temptation because when he is approved, if you're enduring temptation, you say, God, how long? Until God says, now I put my seal of approval on you. 
Endurance brings God's approval on your life. Amen? Add to your faith endurance so others can see Christ in you. Thank you for enduring. Let's turn to our feet. I think everything about this morning is about endurance. Just call the worship team out, please. and Let's take a moment to just wait upon the Lord this morning before we close. Maybe there are things in your life where you need to say, God, I'm willing to endure some hopes, some dreams, some expectations. Maybe they're delayed and, and you're wondering why. Probably God spoke to you this morning and said, you know, you need some endurance. Because endurance develops character. Endurance is what brings us to a place of maturity in God. So would you take some time before we dismiss this morning just to pray and say, God, I'm willing to pursue. I'm willing, Lord, to persevere. I'm willing to patiently wait. I'm willing to passionately hold on. You take some time just to pray before the Lord, however he has ministered to you this morning. Add to your faith endurance. Would you take some time to pray and say, yes, Lord. James says, let endurance have its complete work. Let endurance run its full course. Don't give up in the middle. Don't quit in between. Because then you will be perfect. That is mature. You will be complete, lacking nothing. Would you continue this morning just to say, God, I'm willing to pursue. God, I'm willing to patiently wait. God, I'm willing to press through. God, I'm willing to passionately hold on to what's right in my life. Father, this morning and as we're standing in your presence, God, you know every heart and you know the circumstance each one of us are going through. We pray that this morning by the Holy Spirit, you will strengthen our ability to endure. That by the Spirit of God, you will give us the grace of endurance in our lives. So that God, we can be mature people. We can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Father, I just pray that as each one of us resolve in our hearts to, to patiently endure, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to run with patience, run with endurance the race that is set before us. Father, I pray that even today we will be able to celebrate what you're doing, God. We'll be able to count it all joy and be able to enjoy the journey celebrate what you're doing each day each step of the way that even though sometimes enduring might be difficult we'll still be able to joy rejoice for the joy of the Lord we thank you Father before we close we'd always like to give give an opportunity for people to Make a decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been attending church, but you've never received Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, as, as the God who forgives your sins and makes you a new person. I would like you to do that right now if you would if you feel a prompting inside you. I'd like you to just pray a simple prayer with me. Something like this, saying, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. You're the one who loves me. Forgive my sins, Lord. Make me a new person. And help me to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, I'd welcome you to come and just meet with me. Just let me know that you did that this morning. So we could encourage you, help you in your walk with God. Let's close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Enjoy your holidays.
we trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.